Hello and welcome to the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Uh, my name is Chris Jarvis and I'm in charge of the adult programme, the events and talks here at the museum. And the big news is we are open. We've been open since Monday. You can come and visit this wonderful place for yourself and, uh, and gain inspiration from our some seven million specimens, the building. And in fact, we actually have opened with several wonderfully inspirational artworks as well. So uh, we have um, an artwork by Angela Palmer, which is a fantastic glass sculpture, which was developed in conjunction with the uh, Oxford researchers that were involved in the developing the Austra, uh, Oxford AstraZeneca um, uh, vaccine, um, which is which is actually an, an etching from a scan of the coronavirus uh, done on various layers and lit up so you can walk around it and create an amazing um, scientific and artistic uh, sort of interpretation of that uh, of that virus. Um, and to go with that, we also have another exhibit, um, another art exhibit, which I've seen lots of people in the museum sketching already, which is there to go with our new exhibition which is starting at the end of this month, Meet the Future, the Future of Food. And uh, we have a, a wonderful exhibit by the artist Damien Hurst, Cain and Abel, which is two cows in, uh, two calves in formaldehyde. I've seen a lot of people sketching those and it really raises ideas about uh, our relationship with the food on our plate and the natural environment, life and death. So uh, do come along and see us. Do remember to uh, to book your ticket uh, before you come. Uh, but we're open every day now from uh, 10 o'clock in the morning to five at night Sundays as well. So if you can do come and visit us, it's wonderful to see so many people back in the museum. But of course, if you can't visit us, we still want to offer you inspiration at home. So uh, we want to show off our specimens and we want to get your creative juices flowing. So we're still running these drawn to nature events. So for those of you who haven't joined us before on one of these drawn to nature events, um, these aren't formal art lessons. So these are more like, a, let's say you've got a private tour behind the scenes with one of our expert staff and uh, a chance to talk to him for about 20 minutes or so and chat about what he does for a, a living. And then uh, before he gets out some uh, some rather spectacular specimens and you could sit with your, your sketch pad and just, you know, sort of draw to your heart's content. So the format is a bit like this. We have 20 minutes with our speaker, our expert staff member, he'll tell you all about one of his passions. Uh, and then we'll follow that with some sketching challenges for you. So we start with two two minute speed sketching challenges. So these are a specimen for two minutes each, which is just really there for you to uh, sort of get your creative juices flowing. Just, just let your pencil start finding its way around the pencil around the uh, paper, sorry. Um, that's followed by a six minute challenge, which is a little bit more detail of a specimen, which is a little bit more intricate. And then we follow that up with a 10 minute challenge, again, getting a bit more difficult, a little bit more you know, challenging for you. And that's finally finished off with a 15 minute extravaganza. And we've got a beautiful smorgasbord of some specimens for you to draw tonight. Now, because we want these uh, these sessions to be interactive as possible and, and to inspire you scientifically as well as creatively, we really encourage you to ask questions. So if you have any questions tonight for our speaker during the talk, or if you want to take a break and stop hand cramp during your art, and just type them into the chat box there um, on the bottom right hand corner of your screen, and then click the little circle next to it, that'll light up red, and that marks it as a question. And during the event, I'll be collating all of those questions so I can put them to tonight's speaker at the end during that 15 minute extravaganza. So uh, finally, um, we are using Webinar Jam tonight. So um, if you have any connection problems, just click that big red reconnect button at the top of your page and that actually should bring you straight back into the room. Um, we also, um, if you don't get a chance to finish your drawing tonight, we don't want this to be a stressful event. We see these as more well-being events. If you don't get a chance, don't worry, because we post all of these uh, Drawn to Nature events on our YouTube channel, which you can find on our web page, on our home page. Um, so you can revisit them as much as you want and carry on to work if you find the, the time and the inspiration to do that. Now, the last thing to say actually is uh, we we really enjoy loving seeing your your artwork and it's lo been lovely. Now we're open to wander around and actually glance over people's shoulders and see some of their artwork. So if you'd like to share your artwork from tonight, do post it on Twitter, and do um, do copy us in, do tag us in with uh, the hashtag at more than a dodo. That's all one word at more than a dodo because we love seeing your work and we've seen some beautiful pieces, some really interesting bits, and it, it you know it's inspirational for us as well. So the inspiration goes both ways. Now, um, it's time to introduce 
tonight's speaker and uh, who better to talk about the amazing subject of minerals than our very own uh, curator collections manager of the mineralogy and petrology collections here at the museum dr duncan murdoch now duncan did uh, his um, MGL at, uh, at Leicester University, where he studied, uh, he you know, specialised in paleobiology. He then went on to do a PhD at the University of Bristol, where he used the pioneering technique of um, uh, synchrotron radio, radiation X-ray tomography to scan the insides of some of the earliest fossils of vertebrates and brachiopods, giving us a really good picture of the internal structure of some of these very early fossils. He was first a, a Leverhulme um, early career researcher here at the museum, and he's recently got the post of curator of our mineralogy departments in our earth sciences collections, some 40,000 incredibly diverse and twinkly beautiful specimens. So, are you there, Duncan? Hello, good evening. Yep, I'm here, Chris. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Wonderful. I shall let you get on with it. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for that introduction, Chris. I uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, so I'm very pleased that to say that I look after the rocks and minerals and some of the fossils here in the museum. And I would like to share with you um, some something about some of our mineral collections. So rocks and minerals are hugely important, not just because they're beautiful objects. Uh, they're an important resource to understand how the earth has formed, how it works, and also a resource um, in terms of things that we need to use. So there's an old saying that says, if it's not grown, then it's mined. And that's to say that so much of what we use in our everyday lives comes from uh, below the ground. Uh, but today we're going to focus on um, minerals. So I'll just start my slides. So this is a beautiful example of um, an aggregate of some different minerals. And you can see there's a range of different forms, different shapes and colors and um, uh, the relationships of those different shapes. And I want to explore a little bit tonight before you get a chance to draw some of these minerals, what it is that contributes to this range of different types of shapes and forms and colors of minerals uh, that we see. So. Um, so first of all, what is a mineral? So minerals are the components of rocks and rocks are what makes pretty much everything underneath our feet. And just a quick uh, definition. So minerals are naturally occurring. So that is to say they occur in nature. They're not man-made. They're inorganic. So they were created without the action of, of any kind of biological process so that they're not made by animals or plants. They're solids, so they're solid objects, and they have a definitive uh, chemical composition, so you can say what exactly they are made out of. And crucially, they have an ordered atomic arrangement, so they're built in a particular way. And these last two points I'll come back to um, in a little while. But before I do that, a little challenge for everybody. So I'm going to start the poll. So here are four different objects. Two of them are minerals by the definition that I've just given you. So have a go at guessing, if you can, which two of these four, A, B, C, and D, are minerals. So you should see the poll uh, appearing in the chat. And um, so I'll give you a few minutes. I'm not going to tell you what they are until after you've had a go. So don't be shy. There isn't a wrong answer. Well, there is, but I won't judge you if you get it wrong. Yeah, so you should be able to pick your answer in the poll rather than writing it in the chat, or is it not? Oh. Oh, there we go. We've got some answers coming in. I'll just give you a few minutes, or a few moments, I should say. Okay, so lots of you have uh, voted already, so I'll, I'll end the poll there. Don't worry if you didn't get a chance to contribute. Um, so you should see the results. Um, so overwhelmingly, you've gone for A and C. So everyone who Ticked A, you're absolutely right. This is a, a mineral calcite. Um, 
very common, one of the more common minerals on the Earth's surface. C, however, is the trick uh, answer. So that is actually a synthetic spinel, or a so it's a gemstone that's been man-made. So it isn't strictly speaking a mineral. So which of the remaining two are minerals? Well, B is amber. So that, although it occurs naturally, it's not um, inorganic. It's it's formed by a plant. And D are ice crystals. Now, ice crystals you might not think of as being a mineral, but they actually fit all of those um, characteristics that I, I mentioned before. They're, they're solid, they occur in nature, they're inorganic. We know the chemical uh, formula, it's H2O, just like because it is water, and they have this precise defined uh, crystal structure that I'll come back to a little later on. So don't worry if you got that wrong. Um, let's see how many people got a and D. So about a quarter of you. So well done those. You can feel smug for the remainder of the uh, of my talk. Um, but the rest of you, don't worry. It was a, a deliberate uh, trick. So um, a little bit of chemistry before we get into the uh, minerals. So minerals, like everything else, are made up of elements. So the elements are distinguished from each other based on the number of protons in their nucleus. And they're arranged here on a periodic table all the way from hydrogen through to the big radioactive elements uh, going past all of the things that we're familiar with carbon oxygen silica iron now if we um if we want to think about well how are those different elements distributed in the earth's crust and how do they uh, come together to form minerals. So this is a um, a graph. It's the only graph in the talk. Uh, so apologies for those of you who are uh, math phobic, but hopefully I'll walk you through this graph. So just like the periodic table, here we have the elements arranged by their atomic number. So from hydrogen um, on the, the left, as I can see, all the way through to um, the heaviest element that naturally occurs in the crust, which is uranium in this case. And then these are arranged based on how abundant they are in the rocks you see at the crust. Now, this graph is on one of those dreaded logarithmic scales. So I'll walk you through what's going on. So if I turn on the whiteboard, hopefully you'll see my uh, pen. So here we have um, silica. So this graph is um, represents the ratio of all of the elements to silica. So how many do you, of how many um, atoms of this element do you get per million silica atoms in the crust? So here is silica. So there are a million silica atoms per million silica atoms, as you might imagine. So anything above silica is more abundant and everything below is less. And, and you've, these, these abundances very quickly drop off. So here at around 10 to the naught. So, for example, this molybdenum here, that's got around about one molybdenum atom for every million silica and then as you go further down down to these very rare like this um, iridium all the way down here which is one of the rarest uh, metals in the earth crust there's a millionth of an atom so one iridium for every million million silica so you can see there's this huge um, disparity in, in how abundant different elements are in the earth's crust and in fact if I turn off the whiteboard and see it better. In this uh, dark green circle are the most abundant um, elements, the so-called rock forming elements. That's because they form the majority of the rocks. If you take just the silica and the oxygen, you get about three quarters of the Earth's crust. If you add in six others, aluminium, iron, calcium, sodium, magnesium, and potassium, you get up to 99% of the Earth's crust. So with just eight different elements, we can build basically all rocks uh, with just a little sprinkling of some of the other elements um, affecting things. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And of that remaining 1%, um, 0.6, so 0.6% is titanium. So all of the rest of these elements are in less than half a percent of the Earth's crust. So uh, going back to what is a mineral then, so I said I'd focus in for the remainder of my talk on these last two factors that define a mineral. So that's having a definitive chemical composition and an ordered atomic arrangement. So if we take those 
eight ingredients, eight main ingredients, how do they get put together in different ways to give us this huge variety of different mineral forms that we see and in occurring in nature. So for the next part, I'm going to stop the slides and you can join me back in the museum. Okay, so I have here a beautiful example from our collections of a piece of um, uh, mineral halite. So this is rock salt. So hopefully you can see these beautiful cubic minerals occurring on this um, sample here. So we have these lovely cubes of salt. So if you've ever um, looked at rock salt closely, you'll notice it has this cubic form. And that is all to do with the chemistry. So I'm sure most of you are aware salt is formed of sodium chloride. So I have here a model of the uh, crystal lattice of sodium and, and of salt. So it's these alternating sodium and chloride ions arranged in this cubic um, form. So that so the, the way that these um, atoms arrange themselves in the crystal produces this cu cubic structure at an atomic level. And that is replicated at the macroscopic level by these actual um, by the, the cubic crystals. So I have some wooden models here of some different um, elements, so different uh, crystal forms that obey the same rules as this cubic lattice. So if we have a look at the, the symmetry of a cube, essentially we have three different um, rotational axes. So you can rotate it this way, this way, or this way. And all of the faces are the same length. And there are a number of different shapes that obey those same rules of symmetry. So obviously there is a cube like this one here, um, but there are some more complicated shapes here like this. This is a dodecahedron or a, a range of other shapes. Um, it was just, just another one. So lots of different minerals obey this, this cubic uh, rule of symmetry to give a range of different forms. So if we then um, start to break those the, those rules in different ways, we, we get to different crystal uh, systems. So the so-called tetragonal system. So here's an example of a, a tetra tetragonal uh, model. So this is just like the cube, except one of those planes. So we have these three perpendicular rotational axes, but one of them is longer than the others. So we get these different, um, different crystal forms. Here's another tetragonal crystal. Um, this beautiful example here. If we then allow um, a second axis to be a different length, but keep them all perpendicular, we get this matchbox shape or an orthorhombic system. Again, there are a range of different mineral forms that, that can end up being um, orthorhombic. Then if we add another axis, we get the so-called hexagonal system. So um, here is a hexagon. So again, we have three rotational axes in this plane, but they're all in the same plane and they're all the same length. And then we have a fourth axis that is a different length and perpendicular to that plane. So we have, so here a hexagonal prism, but you can have a range of different hexagonal um, uh, minerals. And to give you an example, here is another crystal uh, lattice. So it consists of these red, um, these red oxygen atoms and these white hydrogen atoms. There's two for every oxygen. So those who, those of you who are, know their chemistry will immediately know, and in fact, almost everybody will immediately know that's water. So in this case, this is ice. And if I hold it in, in this orientation, you can see we, the, um, the bonds between these um, atoms form this hexagonal structure, which is replicated in the ice crystals themselves. So if you, you see these photographs of, of snowflakes, they have this hexagonal form. And that's because of the way that the, um, the atoms are arranged in the crystal lattice. Then if we allow these axes to not be perpendicular to each other anymore. So here we have um, a monoclinic crystal. So two of the axes are, are, are perpendicular, but the third isn't. So we have this um, sort of pushed over matchbox shape um, or another example here where this where in, the, in this orientation it's a kite and in this it's a, a kite with a, a different um, ratio of the axes um, so we have these three different kite shapes producing this um, three three-dimensional structure then if we say well 
what happens if none of the um, axes are perpendicular to each other? So you can have a triclinic uh, structure here, so a triclinic crystal lattice, where we have um, none of the axes are perpendicular and none of them are the same length anymore. Um, and many different minerals form these and get these beautiful um, natural uh, shapes. Um, and finally, the last mineral system I want to um, talk to you about um, is represented by this lattice here. So this is a trigonal uh, mineral. So we have axes of equal lengths, but none of them are perpendicular to each other anymore. So you can see you have this very complex um, looking crystal lattice, but it's made up of uh, calcium, carbon and oxygen. So this is a calcium carbonate or a calcite. Um, so this is what um, produces, for example, the White Cliffs of Dover or limestones or um, the shells of different um, um, creatures that you might think of. So from just arranging these atoms in different ways because of their physical properties, you get crystals with different atomic structures and therefore different um, overall um, form. And this can be very important. So um, if you have a significant other that you want to buy some carbon for, so you could either arrange your crystal lattice like this, where um, all of the bonds between the, the carbon atoms are all the same length, or you could arrange the crystal lattice like this, where you have sheets where the um, you have these hexagonal um, carbon atoms, and then in between them, weaker bonds um, between these sheets of carbon. Now, if you went for this option, you'd be buying them a diamond. If you went for this option, you'd be buying them a pencil because this is graphite, this is the crystal structure of graphite. This is the crystal structure of diamond. And there's nothing else that separates these two um, minerals except the way in which the carbon atoms are packed together. OK, so I'll go back to the slides. So just a quick summary then, those are those seven crystal uh, systems. So don't worry if you haven't taken away the details. It's just to say that the way that different elements pack together produces these different um, uh, mineral forms. And here are some examples from our collections of minerals that have these different forms. So when you're doing your drawing challenges later on, you might look out for these different relationships between the lengths and the angles between different planes. So we have, um, Magnetite is isometric. Chalcopyrite here is uh, tetragonal. These are sulfur crystals just made out of the, uh, elemental sulfur that are uh, orthorhombic. Hexagonal apatite. Um, kyanite here is, is um, triclinic, selenite, monoclinic, and calcite that I already mentioned, which is rhombohedral. But it isn't just the crystal lattice that dictates what a mineral ends up looking like. There are other factors. Um, so here is an, uh, another um, phenomenon that happens with some minerals known as twinning. So this is where you have two minerals growing together with the same crystal properties and they uh, join together. So we have this twinned calcite. So we have these two beautiful um, ROMs of calcite that have uh, joined together to produce this twinning effect. Another thing that mineralogists talk about, as well as um, the crystal structure, is the, the, the crystal habit. And this is essentially how those crystals of different sizes are arranged in space. Um, so th there are many of different uh, crystal habits. Here are just a few. They get named after the uh, overall f the uh, form. So things like fibrous or acicular or needle-like. Um, dendritic, they look like um, branching of a, of a tree. And here are just a few examples of how crystal habit can dramatically change the appearance of a, a, a mineral. So we have this, um, this um, uh, marble, which is another way of forming calcium carbonate. We have these sheets of muscovite uh, mica, these blades of uh, actinolite or little needles of nitrolite. And down on the bottom row, we have this botryoidal malachite, um, some dendritic uh, pyrolusite that you'll see more uh, a bit more of later on, and this waver light that produces these radiating crystals. So um, we can get crystals in different crystal systems, producing a whole range of different uh, habits that give us the, this range of different minerals that we can see.
Then, of course, there is colour. So minerals come in all of the colours of the rainbow. Um, so here are just a, a, some examples of minerals of, of, of different colour. Now, often it's these little sprinklings of these other elements that are producing the colours that change the way that light interacts with the crystals. So it may be that different wavelengths of light get absorbed or reflect, reflect, reflected or refracted in different ways. And the way in which light interacts with the crystal lattices and those different elements can produce dramatically different colours in very, very similar um, otherwise very, very similar minerals. So here are four examples. All of these are silicon and oxygen. They're all forms of the mineral quartz. So it's sometimes uh, entirely transparent, but little impurities can give you um, big differences in the color. So we have amethyst, is this beautiful purple color. We have this black uh, smoky quartz or pink rose quartz. So by just um, adding tiny amounts of impurity to that crystal lattice, we get a whole range of different colors. And then finally, this is one of my favorite minerals. This is uh, called labradorite. Um, so this is me holding it. You can't, you have to move it in the light to get it just right. And I like this because it's all of these different factors are contributing to giving labradorite this, uh, this beautiful color. So we have um, twinning going on, which is giving these stripes. You can see the, sh the shapes of the crystal laths as they're growing together. And then the color is produced by the way in which light is uh, bouncing off the different layers of these uh, twin minerals to give you this, this amazing um, iridescent effect. So when you move the labradorite in the light, it changes in color. And this is often, uh, this, is, uh, this mineral is in um, several decorative stones that often form the facing. So those of you that are in Oxford, uh, there are some beautiful examples of labradorite on Morden Street near the, the supermarkets there, but have a look out for um, for this, this beautiful mineral. So with that, then I'll um, stop the presentation and hand back over to Chris, who will introduce the first challenge. Thank you very much, Duncan. That's absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's incredible to uh, to think what, you know, the earth is actually made of and, and how such sort of simple rules can, can you know sort of produce such complex and beautiful gems and um, amazing we got 40,000 of those to uh, you know to, to, to look out in our in our collections and and I can't wait to, to actually come and peek around them myself a bit later uh, so now on to our first challenge so uh, remember we start off with two speed sketching challenges these are just two minutes each just to get your eye in and this first rather beautiful example is an example of the mineral pyrite uh, which is iron sulfide and this uh, this particular specimen comes from spain so you have two minutes enjoy drawing it
So I hope you're uh, drawing this, enjoying drawing this wonderful kingfisher. Um, this is a, there's a brilliant version of a painting of one of these by uh, John Ruskin, who was, who was also involved in building this, uh, this museum, um, if you want to look that up at some point. But we're coming up to the end of this first sketch, and it's time to move over to your second speed sketch challenge. And this is arrangement of three feathers, three display feathers, a peacock, a pheasant, and an ostrich feather. And you have two minutes just to get your eye in and let your pen wander. So we're just coming to the end of that speed sketch challenge. Don't worry if you didn't finish off. You can obviously revisit these on YouTube, on our YouTube channel at any time you want to finish things off. But we're time. it's time now to uh, move on to our next six minute study. And this is a rather beautiful green woodpecker. These obviously the, the birds you hear yaffling away um, in your gardens. There we are, I think we've just got him all in shot now.
So we've got about two minutes to uh, to finish off that, uh, that rather beautiful drawing of a, of a green woodpecker you're working on, after which we'll move on to our 10 minute challenge. Let's say, don't worry if you don't finish this tonight, you can revisit it again on YouTube if you, if you want to get a bit more detail in it. Okay, now it's time for our 10 minute challenge. And this one is a rather nice composition because uh, it gives you a bit of a contrast. We've got a barn owl, which is our taxidermy specimen, and a rather wonderful barn owl skeleton as well, which shows you just how delicate these animals are inside and how different they look inside to what you see on the outside. Do keep uh, your questions coming in, Lisa. These are rather beautiful questions. I'm really, really hoping I can answer some of these, actually. Uh, really great, great questions. And Laura's going to put them to me um, at the end. Um, we're just lighting our skeleton to get it just right to your drawing so you can have a little rest. And here it is. A beautiful barn owl and the barn owl skeleton. And you have 10 minutes to get a nice bit of detail into your drawings with this one.
and uh, we're just coming up to the halfway mark and uh, you've got another five minutes to work on those, uh, those rather beautiful specimens.
So, Duncan, yeah, over to you. Um, I think you're going to going to tell us something more about these these forms. I think yeah. Thanks, Chris. Just wanted to say that this next um, draw that you're going to look at is a whole selection of different minerals that are all composed of the same basic uh, chemistry. So it's um, this here is a model of um, a silica tetrahedron. So we have a, a silicon atom with four oxygen atoms surrounding it. And as I said before, about 75% of the Earth's crust is composed of silicon and oxygen. This little uh, shape can be put together in a whole range of different ways to give um, a, an amazing array of different minerals. Uh, some of them are, um, are available for you in a moment to have a look at. They're all different forms of this, um, this uh, silica, silicon dioxide. Um, and these uh, silica tetrahedron packed in different ways with different elements give a whole suite of different minerals known as silicates. So the garnet that you saw earlier is, is a silicate with, um, that's based on these uh, tetrahedra put together in different ways. And that gives a whole range of different mineral forms as well. And these um, si silica uh, samples you're going to see shortly were part of the systematic mineral display that was in the museum um, um, previously. Um, so they've been kept together to give a, an, an idea of the, the range of different kinds of specimens that were put on display and to give you a flavour of how um, different silicates can be put, put together. So just as we're uh, setting up and lighting these amazing silicate minerals, uh, Duncan, I've got a, got a question from you from uh, Abigail. She says, what's the rarest or most interesting mineral you've, you've ever come across? Thanks, Abigail. That is a really good question. I think, um, so part of the collection that I'm very lucky to get to look after are the meteorites. So these are rocks from space. And um, I think so the minerals that are contained in these meteorites are probably some of the rarest and most interesting because they give you a glimpse into how the earth itself was formed billions of years ago so things like olivine crystals and these amazing iron and nickel alloys that um, form iron meteorites so i'd probably have to say um, um I'd uh, be a sucker for the rocks from space as well, the, the meteorites. That's fantastic. And um, we just started our, our last 15 minute challenge. So this is this is what a draw might look like. Well, it is what a draw um, looks like from our mineralogy collections of these these silicate minerals, this amazing, amazing variety of shapes, forms and colours. So we're going to give you about 15 minutes to uh, to draw these and get some of these amazing colours and, and shapes down. And, and while we do it, uh, do keep the questions coming in because I'm going to be popping those over to uh, to, to Duncan. Um, Keely asks, uh, Duncan, are opals a mineral? Uh, yes, absolutely. In fact, you, there is an opal in the, the bottom left-hand corner of this image uh, right now. So opals are um, formed from um, silica, which has got a little bit of um, water in it as well. So hydrated, what's known as hydrated amorphous silica. So rather than forming nice crystals like you see in the, the smoky quartz in this image, you get these amorphous layers with different amounts of water um, giving you different crystal structures that the light reflects off in different ways and these beautiful patterns in these. Uh, opals, but yeah, absolutely, it is a mineral. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, even when you're manufacturing, um, crystals for usually for um, aesthetic purposes so you get things like cubic zirconia which is a, a common um, synthetic form of diamond or um, synthetic ruby synthetic emeralds you still need the raw materials so um, all of the all of the materials to, to, to do that comes from either being extracted from extracted from the earth in some way whether that's dug up um, uh, from minerals or from the sea or the or the um, the atmosphere sometimes, but but yeah, even the raw raw materials um, are, are need to be mined from the earth. So we can't synthesize the actual 
elements that we would want to put together to make these different things. We can only put them together in different ways. It's really important that we manage resource um, on, in the earth very carefully. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just quite interesting as you talk about um, uh, man-made diamonds uh, because a, a very dear friend of mine when he died he in his in his will he asked to be turned into a diamond um, and uh, and set in his wife's ring so we could we could actually refer to him as, as her husband the diamond geezer so uh, <laughs> there's a thought for you with uh, with um, you know sort of what you, what you might want to, ha want to happen to you and, and the manufacture of diamonds now um, uh, Abigail asks um, are there any minerals that require incredibly specific conditions to be made? And I know there are all sorts of conditions under under which minerals form. But but you know, so what are some of the some of the rarest ways in which in which minerals are formed, or the most specific ways? Yeah, that's a really great question too. Yeah. So the um, the great thing about minerals is that um, many of them do have very very specific conditions, and they actually can tell the rocks. That contain those minerals we can use the minerals themselves to work out the history of those rocks so for example these those beautiful big garnets that you saw they're only produced when you get um, very high pressure and temperature and when rocks are buried or underneath mountains or down in subduction zones and the the precise um diff the precise levels of temperature and pressure are related to the depth of burial give you different suites of minerals so you can use the minerals that you see as a kind of uh, thermometer and barometer to work out where the rocks have been um, and things like diamonds for example they're only produced in very 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 deep down in the earth's crust and they're brought up to the surface um, in um, often in, in things called kimberlite that's one common way of getting diamonds um, and they tell you that they must have been at very very high pressures uh, so that and minerals of different kinds are extremely useful for telling you about the, the history of the, the rock. That's fantastic, Duncan. Um, and uh, it's amazing what sort of pressures and temperatures happen happened down there. Now, um, there was actually a, a question from Laura, who was um, really interested in the the labels and you know sort of the uncovering of of the you know history of these specimens. And she she asked a very technical uh, curatorial question, really, um, with regards to the labels. She says um, that that we work with and you, and you work with. Are, are you using the same catalog database as the Pit Rivers? Oh, wow. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, we are um, connected with our neighbours uh, next door, the Pit Rivers Museum. So we have um, separate catalogues. So we, we are a, a separate museum. So we're using our own catalogue. I don't actually know what system the Pit Rivers use, but um, that was some, some homework for me to find out, speak to one of the curators. We do sometimes share information between the different um, Oxford museums. So there's um, uh, those of you that have visited, you can. There's a whole range of different museums with different kinds of materials. But even within um, the Museum of Natural History itself, the different kinds of collections are curated in different ways and require different kind of information uh, to be recorded. So the minerals are curated in a different way to the, the fossils or the insects or the um, the spirit specimens. Or um, so we use a very uh, flexible. Uh, databasing system that can incorporate lots of different bits of information and to try and give get the um, records as rich as possible so we can record as much as we can about these objects and on that on that note and actually um, you know sort of recording things um, I know minerals just like animals there are so many common names it can be incredibly confusing trying to work out you know what someone's referring to um, because these common names can really sort of muddy the waters as they you move from uh, from place to place and uh, Barbara says she has something called a druzy and just do you know what that is and, and how it was formed yep so um just to let everyone know that's my mum who's asked that question so hi mum not very often i get to say hi mum um uh, with lots of other people listening so thanks for that question yes yeah, so um this is uh it's a form of quartz so it's just the same kind of um stuff that you're seeing in this drawer here so it's another um form of quartz and um, and as chris mentioned there's these different sort of sets of of uh, terminology come from the fact that different people are interested in different properties of the minerals as objects. So um, a mineralogist might want to know, well, what is the chemistry? What's the crystallography? But um, and someone that uh, 
was interested in it as a gemstone would be interested in the, the cut or the color or so you get a whole range of different um terms by different groups of people that are referring to this actually the same uh, the same stuff um and also it wasn't um the study of minerals goes back much longer than um the understanding of um of, of the sort of uh, elemental understanding of the world so actually you know the, many of these names um give away some information about what people thought about these objects in 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 the past so there's lots of different uh, names out there but that is a, a kind of quartz thanks and uh, actually laura's just replied and i think this this lets me know who which laura this is um and laura says so there is a short section on the database as part of the let's talk labels conservation on the pit rivers museum's uh youtube channel where they talk about some of the misrepresentation in the labels uh and he said since you were debating she says since you were debating the uh if the label were out that the specimen was accurate she was just curious as it's as it's a it's a glam white that's the gardens libraries and museums at oxford university issue that that really interests her um and, uh, and i can understand why uh knowing, knowing uh, who laura is exactly um, I've got a lovely question here, Duncan, um, from from Bridget, who's very interested, obviously, in the models that you were showing us. Um, and she asks, what are the oldest teaching models that you have in the collection? Well, that's a great question, Bridget. I'm going to have to hold my hand up and say I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, so I know we have um, models that were part of the um, displays that, that came out um and that they were bought in the in the 70s and 80s but we have um teaching collections uh we have archives and also apparatus that go back um much older than that so i'll have to uh, have a look to see exactly how old the oldest ones that we have are but we have um quite a big collection of these um these models in different media so i showed you some of the wooden and those plastic um stick and ball models we have some beautiful paper mache ones and glass that um, they were a bit too fragile to bring out for this um, event, but um, they can be looked at as well. So, yeah, so we have as part of our collections a whole range of different teaching materials as well. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll follow that up. Thanks. Now, I've got a question which really harps back to mankind's sort of earliest interest and scientific interest in um, in minerals and you know, why they're there and what they were for and why, you know, we, we come across them in the earth. And um, and this relates to uh, early beliefs about, uh, about minerals and crystals. And Katerina asks, is it true that minerals have crystal and crystals have healing powers? Wow. Um, well, there are um certainly examples where um you can use different different compounds to treat different ailments um but that's very much in a sort of scientific um viewpoint so from personally i would say that minerals in and of themselves don't have any kind of mystical uh power um but i would say that um you know they do have a a fascination and i think that um you know that that they can inspire and they can be attractive and an interesting object and they can also have a connection to a particular place and time that's really important for somebody so they're not to say that minerals can't be um objects that you can interact with in a sort of emotional way but i don't think they they have their own uh, powers that would be my opinion I think it's really interesting, you know, I mean, whether they, they do or they don't, I, I would tend to agree with you. Uh, when it's interesting that, um, you know, uh, mankind has for, for a long time uh, assumed that all of nature is there for some sort of purpose for us. We, we look at it in a very anthropocentric way we have done for, for many, many years. And, uh, and I, I'm really interested in some of the mythology behind the uses of crystals, particularly, you know, sort of what, what they look like being ascribed to different healing powers or whatever. I know uh, carnalite because it, it looks like meat and was named after meat was supposed to, you know, sort of help people with, uh, you know, sort of uh, muscle issues and things like that. One of my favorites actually is uh, is jade and the, uh, the, uh, the Chinese uh, emperor's belief or the ancient Chinese uh, believing that um, jade, if you ate it, would make you immortal and stop flatulence, which uh, you know seems to be why jade was was so uh, so upheld so uh, so highly. Um, do you have any favourite mineral myths from uh, from the past, Duncan? Oh, wow, 
Yeah, I think you've 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 already uh, stolen my thunder. I suppose I think that would probably have been the one that I would have gone with as well. But yes, yeah, so I'll have to I have to think about that. But yeah, it's, it's well. Funny. Um, actually, it's a way of doing that. Actually, we've got a, a really good um, question from Eddie. Now, Eddie says, does my body contain minerals? And if so, which ones? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question, Eddie. So um, the, we have a, a lot of different elements that you wouldn't imagine that would necessarily be in, a, in the body. That's very important in, in very small quantities. And actually, you know, if you were to look at that graph that I showed you um, of the, the abundance of different elements in the crust, organisms like us are very good at concentrating those rare elements in 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 certain places and um, so we have you know things like iron and, and manganese and, and zinc and all sorts of things in terms of the you know crystal mineral structures themselves so we have so-called bio minerals so these are minerals that break one of those rules that i said earlier because in that they're not they are um, um organic so they're produced by an, an organism. So our bones and our teeth are composed of um, a form of the mineral apatite, that's, that's calcium uh, phosphate. Um, so different um, crystal shapes that are, are, are the, their shape is um, grown in combination with that, with the living tissue that actually um, means that we can we, we remodel bones and grow them in, in, in particular ways. Uh, but across the animal kingdom, there are a whole range of different uh, minerals that different different animals um, use. So you'd be probably familiar with shells of things like snails that use calcium carbonate. But there's this amazing snail that lives in um, lives in, in deep sea vents that uses um, metal to build this uh, this sort of um, a chain mail armor, if you like. By uh, and uh, there there's iron, for example, in in the, the teeth of some rodents they get this sort of orangey color so yeah there are different organisms use different uh, minerals in all sorts of different ways i think probably my favorite are are um the so-called glass sponges that build their um their skeletons out of uh, literally out, out of glass out of, out of um silica and, and oxygen these absolutely incredible um features that you can see so yeah organisms uh, animals plants also do it as well so that's a great question. Thanks. That's absolutely fantastic, Duncan. Well, thank you so much indeed for uh, for you know, giving us so much creative and scientific inspiration today and in explaining the, the wonders of the world beneath our feet, the wonders of mineral. Um, we are now going to draw this event to an end. So I hope you've enjoyed that. And do remember to uh, to post any of your artwork uh, that you'd like to share on Twitter and copy us in at More Than A Dodo. We'd love to see uh, all the different media you use and the different ways in which you represent our specimens. And remember, if you can visit us, do visit us. We're now open from 10 o'clock to 5 o'clock every single day. And you can come in and actually draw in the museum. Remember to book a place. But you can also see some of the amazing artwork that we've managed to reopen with that beautiful glass sculpture of, from Angela Palmer. And, uh, and also um, you can have a look at uh, Damien Hurst's wonderful uh, cane and Abel as well. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us tonight. And if you do want to catch up on these events, remember you can always revisit them and finish your art off on our YouTube channel. Good night, everyone.